nice to have and see you all here online and also to have um, a number of people here in the room, which is really nice. Um, so first, a little disclaimer, this is my first time presenting in a hybrid format, so hopefully that will all go smoothly. So basically, um, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about our partnership that we have with Ohio University and GSG College in India. And the it, this really started formally when my mom and dad created two endowments at Ohio University. Will you flip to the next slide? OK, and so um, yes, this is about the OU GSG College partnership. And you can go to the next slide. So we have two endowments here that my mom and dad established. And the first one is the chair in Indian religion and philosophy, which is essentially a chair that establishes a tenure track professor who is a scholar of Hinduism and who also has knowledge of the Sanskrit, Indian religious traditions, and also the principles of Mahatma Gandhi. My mom is from a city in India, Ahmedabad, Gujarat, which is where Mahatma Gandhi started his movement. So my mom has been really influenced by the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi as well as Nehru, and is a, a, a scholar, essentially, I would say, of, of Mahatma Gandhi. And he's his principles have definitely influenced my upbringing. And um, that was appointed to Dr. Brian Collins. We launched these two endowments officially in 2013. And so that was when Professor Collins joined. You can go to the next slide, please. The second endowment is a gift endowment which enables grants. So basically this establishes an account that provides grants to faculty and students who want to work with us in GSG College in Central India. And it provides a number of opportunities for research, teaching, service, which we'll dig into a little bit further. And what this, you can go flip to the next slide. What this endowment uh, enabled us to do was to really formalize a relationship that already existed. My mom and dad moved with my brother and I to Athens and I shouldn't date myself, but it was in the 1970s. And um, so we've you know been in Athens for a long time. And so we developed relationships with people at the university and uh, so a lot of people from Ohio University and Athens would come visit the college. And, and so it kind of started off as a, an informal relationship. So I'll tell you about the history and the background of GSG College. You can go to the next slide. So GSG College is located in Umarkade, Maharashtra. And Umarkade, Maharashtra is pretty much in the center of India, a very internal, region and in many ways there are similarities to Athens, Ohio and that they're both remote rural areas. Now in Umarkade we have an airport about two hours away so we're similar in that sense to Athens as well and on the unfortunate side um, as Athens County is one of the poorest in the United States, Umarkade is considered a backwards district um, and is there are about 150 uh, to 200 districts in India that are considered backwards because they have particularly poor access to infrastructure. Uh, so clean drinking water, running water, um, access to health care, uh, high rates of illiteracy. So a lot of um, challenges that you see facing um, certain under, uh, they say underdeveloped parts of the world, but I know there's different views of that word. Um, but at any rate, those are the challenges that face Umarkade. Um, but you know, another similarity with Athens is that our, the size of the city of Umarkade itself 
is similar in population to Athens. It's only about 35 to 40,000 population. Um, however, one difference is that even though it's considered a rural area, in the region um, of a size that's about the same size as southeastern Ohio, there is a population of 2 million people. So India, as you know, is a very populated country, so it's, it's a very populated region. And it's mostly an ag agrarian farming region. So just as you drive from the airport to Athens, Ohio, you pass rolling hills and farms and pasture land and animals. And similarly in India, you pass farmlands and animals, except the difference is you'll have a lot more animals crossing your road and you'll have to stop for them <laughs> as goat or buffalo may be passing. And next slide, please. These are some photos of life in Umarcade, in the home, in the kitchen. So you'll see she's cooking on a stove in her home and the, just the fire is there and she's rolling some chapati bread. Next slide. So the name of this college, we call it GSG College and it's a mouthful, but there's a story behind it. So the name is actually the name of my father's mother. Her name was Gopika Bai Sitaram Gawande. And in India and in that region, the tradition is to take your husband's name as your middle name. So in that way, her name actually represents both my grandfather and my grandmother. My grandfather was a farmer himself, and my dad tells the story of how his father would tell the story of how they had become so poor that they could only eat one piece of chapati for the whole day and had nothing to put on it. And he sat under a tree and thought, what can I do? And somehow, little by little, he was able to work on the farms, acquire one acre, acquire another acre. And ultimately, he grew um, mango trees and sugar cane and all kinds of food for his family and for his um, income and was able to support the family. However, my dad's mother died of malaria and my dad was very young. And so he remembers his mother and wanting to help um, save her. And there was no doctor there, no nurse. There was um, a local medicine person who told him some uh, prayers to say and to give some raisins or some fruit. And he very diligently followed these instructions, but it did not work to save his mother. But this had a profound influence on my dad's life. And then he became a physician and soon he was able to do something to help the region in India. And so just below it, you see the gateway to the college in India. So the college, when my dad and mom um, donated funds to help establish the college in India, they said to him, you can name the college however you would like to name it. And so he chose to name it after his mother. Next slide. So the birth of the college, it was actually started by a group of local farmers in the region and they had raised enough money to um, build the foundation of one building. They themselves had the vision of having a college in the region and they were operating from a high school building. They were able to get the government to grant the land for their building, but they couldn't raise enough money to build more than the foundation. And at that time, my mom and dad um, had reached a point um, by the time of 1985 that they wanted to do something to help the region because my father was seeing that although he had managed to find this opportunity to get a medical education, come to the United States, he saw that the people, um, his own family members, the people in his village, the people in the surrounding villages, they weren't getting that opportunity. And I remember, in fact, 
on one of my trips in college and I we flew to a big city of Nagpur, which at that time was uh, you had to fly to Nagpur and drive about six hours to get to the college. And I stayed at a hotel and the fellow at the hotel said, you're going to such a small place. How is it that anyone from that small place is gone to the US. How did that happen? So even there in Nagpur, they felt that, gee, that's such a remote place. How how is it that anyone from there could, you know, get a, a you know, doctoral education? So uh, you could flip to the next slide. So my mom and dad provided the uh, seed money to build the first building, but really it grew through um, an Athens connection. So it, we had a number of people from Athens who donated funds and the Athens Rotary Club also helped raise funds. We did matching grants. Um, my mom and dad uh, worked with folks there in India to establish a Rotary Club there. And um, so the Rotary Clubs there have been tremendously active. So we have a full campus of buildings that really is the product of this connection with Athens. Like Athens literally has roots in India in Umarkade. Next slide, please. The college today, so you could see it, we really have all the major subjects, you know, from botany and chemistry to physics and zoology, commerce, arts, science. I haven't listed everything here. Um, and also we offer vocational diplomas, for example, related to agriculture and horticulture, crop science, dairy science, et cetera. Next slide. So the partnership, um, next slide. So in 2013, when we launched both of these endowments, uh, we when we started Ohio University, offered to have someone from OU travel with me to India to conduct a needs assessment. So my father had passed away in 2011 and I knew that I wanted to continue the work that my parents had started. And it had always been an interest for me really since I was very young because each time that I would visit, I was just, I felt close to the people there both people I was related to and people I was not related to, but I could see obviously the tremendous opportunities that I have. And as a small child, you don't understand why doesn't this little girl have the same opportunities that I have? And so it was just a natural feeling that what can I do to help? So it had always been something in my mind. And when my father passed away, I said, now is the opportunity. And so Brooke Hollowell from Ohio University came with me to India. And even though I've been going for so long, I wanted to really just have a fresh beginning to talk with people and ask them, what are the needs that you have? What are your goals? What are you striving for? And what are the obstacles you're facing? And based upon that needs assessment, we kind of distilled down three major areas that we wanted to address. So it was technology. We did not, there were computers here and there, but the there was hardly any of them were connected to the internet. Those that were had a dial-up connection, so you couldn't load websites. Um, even emailing was difficult. People, most of the faculty, let alone students, did not have access to emails. Um, and in fact, people weren't quite sure what was the point? What was the point of being on the internet? How was this going to help us do what we need to do? But having come from a great university system like Ohio University, you can once you see something, you know what it can offer. Um, in addition, infrastructure issues, buildings, maintenance. And another big issue was career development. When I would speak to the students, most of them were children of farmers. And I would ask them, how many of you want to be a farmer? and they would giggle and very few would raise their hand. They were looking for opportunities outside of farming because they saw that the lives of their families was very difficult and very challenging. So they were looking for other opportunities. And so that was 
something that I saw as, as a need was how do we really open up those opportunities and prepare them. We did have one uh, alumni who had done very well and managed to get a company to come to recruit on campus, but the students were not used to speaking with people in that type of a setting. And they, they didn't even really know what a sales representative was. So we realized, okay, we really need to do a lot of focus work on career development. So that was 2013 when we identified these needs. Next slide, please. And so we began collaborative projects here at Ohio University. And one of our first projects and our very first grant from the Gift Endowment went to Bridgeview Thunkachan. And Brooke Hallowell was like a matchmaker. She, she said to me, you know, there's this really great graduate student who's doing his PhD in educational technology. And I think he might be interested. So she spoke with him and um, it really began a relationship that continues to this day and is going to continue even more and is blossoming. Um, but basically Bridgeview started the beginnings of how do we make this a digital campus? How do we network our computers? How do we get them connected to the internet? How do we train our faculty and our students on using the tools of the internet in teaching? and the tools of technology and teaching? And how do we get our students to be ready for the world of today and tomorrow? How do we get our students to function on the same level as students across the globe? And so we had an, a number of grants over year, the years, um, and it's a continuing thing, as you know, in any environment, technology is moving so fast. So we've had um, just most recently, immediately before the pandemic, Greg Kessler, was there. Uh, Matt Morrison, who's here today, was also there. And uh, Saijeevan Devi Reddy was also there. So it's really been a whole team effort to get our technology up to date. And that really paid off during the pandemic because during the pandemic, we were ready. And our students were ready to be on the internet. And there were some students that were in remote locations that did not have funds for phones, unfortunately but 60% um, of our students did have access to a mobile phone and had internet and could cont continue with their online classes. And most importantly, exams are a huge deal there. Their exams are a huge deal here too. Um, and so the big deal was how do you get through these exams um, in a pandemic? And so they had to be online. We managed to figure out a way to offer in-person and online but you won't believe it, even those 40% students who didn't have an access to a phone for their classes, they got access to a phone for their exams. And every single student chose to go online for their exams. And we had 100% attendance at the exams. And we'd heard stories of other schools where the exams, um, the internet went out, students were kicked out, they were deemed to have failed but all of our students did not have those problems and we moved through. So that was really an outcome of this relationship that we started in 2013 with Ohio University. And we've had a number of other projects as well, um, which are ongoing. And just to kind of flip through them, they each deserve a story, but I'll just go through them quickly. Um, one is Jagen Pille, who's a professor of psychology in the education department. And um, so he worked with us around counseling and uh, mind mapping strategies as well. English as a second language, Greg Kessler came and worked with our English language department there. And Jerry Krizik is working with us to continue that and provide some online programs, both for our faculty and students. And um, Brian Collins really just on his own uh, had working with my mom had this vision of creating a study abroad there with Ohio University and he and Julie White who's in the Center for Gender and Sexuality Studies created a study abroad program together and so they've gone there a number of times with a group of usually about eight students and um, they were scheduled to go just when the pandemic hit but we're looking forward to when it's safe being able to get that up and running again as well. And there might be a possibility for somehow doing that online. 
And because once you kind of have this infrastructure, then it does naturally spawn other projects because now you have a place that has, we, we have a guest house there with 10 rooms, bathrooms, um, we provide meals. And so, you know, we have an infrastructure there that makes it easy for people to come. Uh, um, our team there in India is used to having visitors from the United States and, um, and has been able to host people for a few decades now. So as a result, we've had a number of other projects that were spawned. So for example, Pranoy Rai was a graduate student in geography here, and he did a project on food security. He now has a PhD and is at Portland State University. He continues to work with us, and he focuses on labor and migration, as well as climate change, because with climate change, we are seeing more people getting displaced because of the change in climate, and that's causing greater migration. And that's forecasted to, uh, we're globally, we're forecasted to see millions more getting displaced by climate change. So the, that raises the question of how do we reverse that trend? Uh, solar energy, Greg Kamer uh, helped us establish a solar energy facility there. So now uh, we were having a lot of blackouts during the monsoons and just, you know, every day a blackout. So the solar energy was really huge in enabling us to make use of this technology that we have. It doesn't work if you have a blackout. Um, video making, so Andy Wallace video class made um, a video to really tell the story in a succinct way about um, the history of the college. And water, we've started a project uh, in the past year with Daniel Che and a graduate student focusing on water issues there. Next slide. So as a result of the success, um, you see these two happy Umarcade um, uh, citizens, farmers on their cell phone and um, cell phone technology has reached very quickly there. And that's, that's really helped things tremendously. Next slide. Here's some snapshots of GSG College today and you see the beautiful Rangoli, which is the local colored powder art design. Next slide. So what's next? <clears throat> next slide. So when my mom and I were visiting the college a few years ago, a group of students approached us and they passed us a note and the note said, please help us do something for the students whose fathers are farmers who committed suicide. And then when I began to look at this and ask people and talk to people, we learned that in the district, it's the Yowethmal district, which has about 2 million people, that that year um, about 300 farmers had committed suicide. And when we began, I began to research it, I saw that this had been a trend for over the past, now, then it was, you know, well, 10 years, but then I began to see it was even longer than that. Next slide. So the farmer's suicide um, said to me that there's still challenges that are happening here. How is it that we have been able to bring education opportunities to this region, but yet, why are farmers still committing suicide at the rate of one a day? Something must be going wrong. And what can we do to change that? And what I began to learn as well was that not only is farmer suicide in India very high, but the highest is in the state that we're from. And within that state, the highest is actually in six districts, and we are one of those six districts. So what's happening in our district that's leading to this? And I don't have an answer for you. We have theories, and we, um, but, but this said to me that we need to dig into this and find a solution. Next slide. 
And this is just a visual to show you the state of Maharashtra. And next slide. So then on top of this, um, this was also just two years ago, the college was not able to open on time and open the dormitories on time because we had run out of water and there was a severe drought there. And my mom and dad with Rotary Club, the local Rotary Club, Rotary Club International, 15 years ago had established bore wells. So there were 20 bore wells, both at the college and surrounding villages. Those bore wells had run dry. So we had to truck in water in order to open up the dormitory. By the way, we currently have about 3,000 full-time students at the college and about, well, I would say 3,500 full-time students and about 1,500 continuing education students. So people at any stage of their uh, career can take continuing education. So as we're experiencing this drought, the World Bank came out with a report forecasting what is going to be the impact of global warming for the next 30 years to the year 2050. And um, focusing on South Asia, what is going to be the impact in South Asia? And where is it going to affect quality of life the most? And so the on the left is the moderate case scenario, and on the right is the severe case scenario. So it's forecasted to be somewhere between the left and the right. And you can see that the hot spot is two hot spots, and the one right in the center of India is right where we are. That was a shocking wake up call. One of the trustees had said to me, what can you do to help the farmers with drought? And you think, well, I, you know, as much as we can do, how do you solve for drought? How, how, you know, what can I possibly do? Next slide. Same land, different management. So as I began to research this question, I, I happen to live in Boulder, Colorado, where there is an effort to um, promote what's, what's called um, agroecological farming or regenerative agriculture. And the basic idea is that do we want to sustain the planet the way that it is now? Is it in a state of health? Or do we need to actually regenerate it? Do we actually need to restore the health of our planet and literally of our soil? And what we've seen is that our soil has become depleted, that we have a history of farming with chemicals and with single crops that has destroyed the ecosystem. And as a result, the farmers have to pay a lot more money to get fertilizers because if your land doesn't have the nutrients, you have to buy it. And in order to buy it, you go into debt. And then the seeds that have been promoted, you know, conventionally in agriculture for the last 80 years are seeds which do not reproduce on their own. You have to buy them each year. So the trend has been an expensive one where the farmers go deeply into debt. Next slide. So under the current state of agriculture, that's what you see on the right, where versus the natural state of agriculture without the chemicals, the ways of our grandfathers and grandmothers who were farming, you can see this rich root system. Plants whose roots grow six feet, even 14 feet deep. This brings all, a whole ecosystem of micronutrients and life into the soil. Next slide. And water. This soil farmed regeneratively, really a way that's a natural way that existed in our grandparents' time, holds more water. So this prevents drought and this prevents flooding because when you have those heavy rains, it washes off the topsoil if there's nothing to hold it and draw the water down. But once you, you integrate natural farming, 
the water can now be held and retained in the soil, solving for floods, solving for drought. And there's actually a foundation named the Pawnee Foundation, which has worked with us at GSG College with villages in the region on water harvesting in the region. And the villagers saw results. During the drought, they were able to produce even more crops than before. Next slide. And in addition, this method of farming sequesters carbon in the soil. So it actually over time can help reduce greenhouse gases. And there's a whole movement happening internationally to use, on one hand, it's restoring these natural ways of farming, but it's also bringing in a lot of modern knowledge about how to farm. And, um, and so it's basically, you know, integrating with the animals, which is natural to do in India because especially in this region, all the animals are grazing there, but doing it in an organized fashion, uh, we're seeing across the country and across the globe, the United States and really everywhere, uh, that we're able to farm in a way that is putting nutrients back in the ground. When you had your breakfast this morning, was that food grown in a way that restored the soil or depleted the soil? And so this whole idea is let's grow food in a way that restores the soil and the environment. Next slide. So we formed a project called the Mati Pani Asha Project at GSG College. Mati means soil, Pani means water, Asha means hope. Soil, water, hope. There is hope, not just for this region, but this the story of this region is a story that can be told across the globe. And as we've met with farmers and organizations that work in different parts of the world, we're hearing the same stories and we're seeing the same solutions actually working. And we've, um, we currently have started a project working with an organization that's only four hours away from us. And they've been working with farmers for the last 20 years in helping them transition from chemical farming, out of chemical farming to natural farming. And, um, and the farmers are seeing that they're able to earn as the same income or better and get out of debt. So we are adopting that, that practice at GSG College and we'll see, you know, will this work? And so there's a number of different aspects to this, but we're going to establish a model educational farm. We've already started study groups with the farmers. We met with five villages. We plan to expand into 10 villages. We will have kitchen gardens, which will also be a project to empower the women and provide them a means for sustaining their families. It'll the idea is to bring nutritional foods. So basically when you are focusing on just one or two or three crops, you're growing that in order to sell it and make money. And then that cash that you have is what you have to spend on food. And if it's going into, into paying off debts, there's not a lot of money just for your family's own food. So that story of my grandfather with one chapati, you still hear that story today where a farmer only has enough money for just that one chapati and nothing on it. What's happening? How do we transform this? So, um, so, the, so in, integrated in this is to dedicate a portion of the land for the diverse foods that grow in the region. And anyone who's come there is just a tremendous amount of food and recipes and just a delicious variety. Um, and in addition, what is what is the knowledge of our elders? You know, my grandfather's generation is few of them are left. So we've also developed a project to research and study um, and document the, the indigenous food and farming practices. Next slide. So this brings us to OU and what are the opportunities? And I really just jotted down a few, but it doesn't even begin to um, break open the world of possibilities because once you're looking at 
these different challenges that we're facing, there's so much potential. And I'm, it's also a really exciting opportunity because two things. One, on one hand, when you're working with a region that doesn't have as much, a lot of the problems are solvable and we have the tools and ability to solve it. And so when you work there, you can really have that satisfaction that you're seeing an impact. Um, on the other hand, when we're talking about big issues like global warming and climate change and food access globally, those are huge challenges. And how do we as a globe face those challenges? And just looking at one little microcosm can prevent, can provide a role model for others. So if this project is able to work on dry land in this region that is so hardly hit, so it hits so hard, if we can make a transformation here, well, what else can we do? And how do we then make that knowledge accessible to others? And being a college in that region, we are able to then translate what we're learning into teaching tools and educational models. So, you know, this really opens up possibilities for just about any field. And so I always say, if there are those who have a field where they have some interest, um, there, and, and if there's something here that I've said that sparks you, and it feeds into what you feel your own personal purpose is, because I'm a big believer in really promoting what each person's vision is and what your what drives you. Because I feel like the answer and the truth is like when we follow that drive. And I feel is that each person has their own role to play on the planet. And maybe it has a role in Ubercade, or maybe it doesn't, and it doesn't have to have a role there. But if it happens to be that something I've said sparks some interest related to something you're working on, I would love to chat with you and explore that further and really see how we can support you as well as it, you know, I, I very much believe in a mutual relationship where we can learn from each other. And next slide, please. So if you want to learn more about the collaboration and the projects we've been doing, our website is sesahelps.org. If you want to email me, uh, my email is sumita at sesahelps.org. And um, I'm happy to chat with anyone about that. So I think I'll, I'll close there for now and open it up to questions and answers. Thank you so much. It's such a story of uh, dedication and you know life changing transformative for all that are involved and we're so honored to be part of that story. And you know when I think of Mati um uh, uh Mati, Fani, and Asha, um the soil water hope, it's kind of a um that when I think about it that you had this vision and you plant the seed and it's water it and give hope and grow hope. And Ohio University is one of those branches that are really, you know, there and rooted um, in this partnership and history and try to bear fruit. And I think we're already seeing some of those and can speak to the future of the humanity, the future of the planet. So thank you for all the work that you and you know, everybody who has been involved in that process. So we'd like to open up for questions. I know we have uh, about five minutes. And I don't know if there are any questions in the chat, mm -hmm. uh, but those who are joining um, through the teams, please share your questions in the chat. And anybody in the room, um, any questions or comments? And perhaps those who have been you know, participating in this uh, initiative, maybe if you want to share your thoughts or comments in this, um, uh, in this beautiful story. Hi, I want to add. My husband, I think in 2010, just before he died, he had compiled the sort of it called Circle of Life and the story about his life. And here, there is a story about our connection to the Ohio University. So there are 
lot of interesting stories, stories about how he became a Rotarian or how we did the water project. Um, so maybe I don't want to tell everything about it, but uh, and it's also very inspiring. And I read just a few lines. This I believe this is the, my granddaughter when she was graduating from the eighth grade. She was chosen to be one of the speaker. But she was so modest. She didn't tell her parents. And we didn't go eighth grade graduation. You know who goes mm -hmm. that what she's going to talk about. But this few lines I read. I believe that it is possible to accomplish almost anything and that you should never let fear prevent you from success. I believe this in large part because of my grandpa. So she and to me. It's very touching because. She didn't grow up in Athens, so she had not really been with us that much, but she had heard all of the stories about his life. And um, and she now she's um, uh, working from health and human services, and she is also wanting to make the things better. She wants to go to the police academy because she sees the problem there. And she thinks if she becomes one of them, then maybe she can bring about the changes. So for me, it's very important that first of all, you have to inspire your children. And if you can inspire your grandchildren, I think you have achieved. And um, of course, we inspire our daughter to take over. That, that to me was very, I, I didn't want to. Because I said, no, Mita, you are in 2011 after my husband died. She said that December she was going to leave the job and help me with this. And I said, no, you don't have to. You have your job to do. But she was insistent. So and as far as ideas. I live in a community in a uh, Newton uh, in Boston area where the college has started um, a retirement community. And as a part of it, we are required to take the classes. And I thought that Ohio University can do that if they, you know, put their resources together. That's, that's all. Any questions from anyone? Hmm. There is um, an inquiry about if there's any aspect of history on the areas of rupture within the field that would be most beneficial. Sure, and um, I would love to uh, explore that further with whoever would was asking because I know our time is ending soon, but I do want to also point out that. And this is a, a whole another piece of the story, but Betsy uh, Bridgeu and Bridgeu Dankachan have, who have been working with us are moving to India to Umarkade and will be there for at least the next five years. And so Ohio University will have even deeper roots there and they also will be able to answer some questions as well. So I would love to explore that further if they want to um, contact me. I'd be happy to chat more about that. Have you facilitated any farmer exchanges connecting US farmers with Indian farmers? We have not at this time. I am working with a farmer in Colorado who um, operates a regenerative farm there in Colorado and we visited with them as well. And we had two 
people from GSG College come to the US about two years ago. And we went and visited one of those regenerative farms. And that was a transformational transformative experience and it really showed what a difference it makes to have people from there come here. I myself had not realized the full power of that. We have often had people from the US go to India, but having these two representatives come to the US was very transformative because they could actually see different opportunities and options and how other things work. And when they first were coming, they thought, look, all we need is water. That's all we need. If we just have water, problem solved. Once they came and they started to meet with people, attend conferences um, and see this regenerative farm, then they realized, wait a second, we need something more system wide to transform our situation there. And they went back absolutely motivated. I actually have some beautiful poems that one of the professors, Professor Tide, wrote about his experience as a farmer and he actually saying it here in the US. So that's uh, an indirect answer to your question. I'm sorry. No OK, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and all of you taking the time to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to see you in person. <laughs> <laughs>